Study Unit 5 deals with the processing of accounting data. And when we use the word data, we basically mean your information or your transactions. We're dealing with all of our financial transactions. Students sometimes hear the word data and they get a little confused in terms of all the computer stuff and informational data and everything. What we're talking about here is how do you actually process, how do you capture and record and process the enormous amounts of transactions that take place on a daily basis? So the accounting process that we have looked at and that we have seen up to now, we have basically been trying to apply the accounting definition. Remember the definition that we took a look at right back in study unit one? It's the orderly and systematic recording of the monetary values of the economic transactions of the entity, reporting on the results of those transactions and providing the information in financial statements. And that information is going to be used as a basis for decision making by the users of the information. So this orderly and systematic recording We've been talking about the trial balance, the general ledger, the financial statements that we've been showing you the formats of these statements of profit and loss. We've been showing you the formats of the statements of financial position, the statements of changes in equity. So you can see us as we're digging into this, we kind of keep coming back to this. Make sure that you understand that what we're doing is all part of the accounting process. So where are we at this point in time? What have we covered so far? If we take a look at the transaction occurring right in the beginning and where it's lying on the financial statement, this is pretty much the process that we've looked at up to now. We've had the transaction and straight from the transaction, we've been putting and posting general ledger items. We've been posting the debits and credits. So for every debit, there's a credit and we've created a general ledger account for each and every single transaction and we have posted all of them. From there, we took a look at how the trial balance has developed. Your general ledger accounts are closed off. They are balance and then all your balances are taken to the trial balance and we've also seen in the last study unit how we compile financial statements from the information in the trial balance so our financial reporting process or the accounting process that we've got so far we've dealt with the general ledger we've dealt with the trial balance we've dealt with the financial statements what we need to do is figure out how to make it a lot simpler and a lot more efficient to get from the transaction to the general ledger. So that's what we're going to take a look at in chapter five. The Unfortunately, there is more to the accounting process than what we've looked at already. Although you've covered an enormous amount of information, there is still more to come. If you think of the large volume of transactions that happen on a daily basis at companies, the enormous amount of sales and purchases that goes on on a daily basis, if we posted every single transaction to the general ledger, it would make that GL absolutely enormous. If you go back to study unit four, you'll see we developed our, our little example for Tim's garden service, and we only had 21 transactions. We only had 21 specific transactions that took place, and the general ledger was four pages long. So it's a massive process, and if you take you know, companies that have thousands of sales on a daily basis, it would be absolutely impossible to do. So we as accountants, we never post transactions directly to the general ledger. We never take a transaction that has taken place and place it straight into the general ledger. We use subsidiary journals for this, books of first entry, books of initial entry, whatever you want to call it, subsidiary journals. There are various types and we're going to take a look at that at the moment. But what I want you to understand is there's now a process in between our subsidiary journals. So our financial reporting process is now going to look like this. The transaction takes place, we record it in a subsidiary journal. And from the subsidiary journal, we post the transactions into the general ledger. We create the trial balance and then we compile the financial statements from there. So our subsidiary journals sit nice and neatly between our transactions and our general ledger. Every single transaction is journalized in one or other subsidiary journal before being posted to the general ledger. Every transaction is going to have a source document. So the transactions, every single one of them will arise from a specific document. And on that, all the information that we need is going to be recorded. And we need to make sure we take all those bits of paper, all the source documents, all of them and capture them in the information. We'd like to say that 
transactions of the same kind would be grouped together so that it makes life a little bit easier to deal with. And you can also imagine this makes it easier in a company where there's just far too many transactions for one person to deal with. So you can imagine if I've got a sales department over there and a purchasing department over here, if there was only one general ledger, these two departments would be fighting over being able to record their sales in the general ledger and being able to record their purchases in the general ledger. And the wage department wants to record the wages in the general ledger. So you can imagine you've got one general ledger in the middle and everybody wants to record their transactions in them. It's going to be a bit of a mess. So this way we give the purchasing department a journal and they record everything in the journal. And we give the sales department and the wages and every other department, we give them specific journals. And then once a month, we post all of that to the general ledger. We take all the totals and post it to the general ledger instead of every single item themselves. The types of subsidiary journals, the most common forms are your CRJ, your cash receipts and your cash payments journal. These two are very, very important. We're going to take a look at them first and spend quite a lot of time on them. And the reason that this is generally emphasized is because this is where the bank comes in. It is extremely important to control money coming in and out of the business. It's cash, specifically cash that comes in and out of the business. We want to make sure that we control that. So any type of cash moving in and out of your business is controlled either by the CRJ or the CPJ. So we'll take a look at that. Your sales and your purchases journal are where we buy and sell on credit. And these are not instantaneously cash transactions. So a sales journal is going to be when we sell something to someone, we let them walk out the shop and they say, I'll pay you later. We have a debtor. So a sales journal is going to be recording the sale, but the money hasn't come back in yet. The purchases journal is exactly the opposite, where I buy something from someone, but I'm not paying them. So there's no cash just yet. When eventually I do pay them and when eventually they pay me, we will record the receipts and the payment of that in the CRJ and the CPJ. Your sales returns and your purchases returns just allow for the fact that we often have people come back and bring us the stuff back that they didn't want or it's broken or something's happened to it, as well as the fact that we may do this as well. So we have to accurately record that. And our general journal are for all our other transactions that don't have a nice neat space. So let's go and take a look very, very beginning. Let's go take a look at the cash receipts journal, exactly how to deal with it.